Good. So now it's actually three o'clock. So uh, welcome to this uh, uh, speak. Uh, I, I guess I should say virtual science forum talk. Uh, my name is Tero Heikkila. I am the chairing this session at, the, at, at this talk here, and I'm happy to see uh, several uh, people now participating. Uh, so Risto uh, Oyajärvi is, uh, is a PhD student in University of Juvascula in the Konechmeta Theory Group, which I'm leading. And uh, uh, he will uh, give a talk about our recent work, uh, which uh, I guess the publication of which Risto will tell, tell about. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, you see the title. And uh, yeah, so about the questions, I suggest that if you have any questions during the talk, you either use the chat or you uh, raise your hand. Or if I don't react fast enough, you just uh, ask the question. And then we will have time also at the end of the talk to discuss. So, Risto, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tero, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank, thank the organizers of this uh, virtual science forum for this, for arranging this platform. So, okay, you see the title. It's uh, Superconductivity provides the, a giant enhancement to the spin battery effect. And even though this platform is uh, meant for the reprints, I am actually now. Um, I am abusing this platform a little because, because this is no longer a preprint. It was published yesterday in PRP. As, and the editor decided to change the name a little. So it's giant enhancement, the spin battery effect in superconductor ferromagnetic insulator systems. And here are the co-authors, Tero, Pauli Virtanen, and Mikhail Silaev. So, okay, what is this about? We are talking about uh, basically the, the basic system we are thinking about this uh, ferromagnetic insulator superconductor bilayer <clears throat> and uh, with dynamic magnetization. And let's, let's start to consider this from the ferromagnetic insulator. So what is, what is a ferromagnetic insulator? Basically, uh, well, a metallic ferromagnet is something that ha just has a has a Fermi surface, has finite density of states at Fermi surface, and so it has conduction electrons. Whereas uh, an insulating a ferromagnetic insulator is an insulator, and so it has a gap at uh, chemical potential, and uh, this. This means that, uh, and, and the gap differs from the one spin to another. This um, effect from the spin dependent gap is that even though the conduction, if, if we make a bilayer like this, we put the normal metal and the ferromagnetic insulator next to each other. And then we imagine that the, uh, an electron is coming from the normal metal side and and reflecting from the ferromagnetic insulator boundary. It cannot cannot penetrate into the ferromagnetic insulator because there's no there are no electronic states in the gap. So, but it it has some small penetration depth which depends on the spin, and because of this penetration, it uh, acquires a phase shift in the in the reflection process and these different spins acquire different phase shift now what this means is that if we start from uh, let's say the let's say the magnetization of the ferromagnetic insulator is in the z direction and we take an electron that is uh, with spin in, in x direction. It, it can be expressed as a superposition of up and down spins. And when it reflects it, this, this uh, different components acquire different phase shift. And this, 
this can be then expressed as a sum of uh, x x direction and y direction and so so effectively when uh, when scattering from this uh, boundary it uh, rotated around the z axis now this this was just for a single electron we can we can uh, take a uh, um, we can consider observable so so we want to write some like a classical boundary condition and this same same can can be written like this so so spin current equals uh, some conductance times spin accumulation and then this m here is the magnetization direction in the ferromagnet and this, this is the rotation axis basically and for a ferromagnet insulator, this spin mixing conductance, it's only this is the imaginary part of the spin mixing conductance. I will clarify what I mean by this in a second. Okay, and now, now we want to consider spin pumping in this system. We are following here this. this uh, Nice review by Cherkovniak uh, and others, and so so we can instead of having just a static magnetization in the ferromagnetic insulator, let's imagine that it is processing around some magnetic field. This can be arranged by let's say by ferromagnetic resonance, some some like. A, oscillating magnetic field and then having a static magnetic field in this h direction then, then it will naturally process now what this procession does is that is that it it will pump a spin current into the normal metal it will generate spin current at the interface and pump it into the normal metal and this uh this uh, pumped spin current in the normal metal it will it will be uh, it will generate spin accumulation so some spin spin potential in, inside the normal normal metal and this in turn will will uh, create this this uh, according to this boundary condition that we derived here it will generate some back Back current back into the interface. Oh well, it doesn't penetrate the interface, but but it will still vanish from the normal metal. And uh, so, if this if this spin pumping current looks different that you are used to, here yeah, it's because this is normally uh, this uh, this form of this spin. Spin current depends on whether we are talking about metallic or insulating insulating magnets. So for for metallic magnets, we usually take a real part of the spin mixing conductance, and then this pumped spin current will be something like m cross uh, dm dt. But here it's just the derivative of m. Okay, and then this uh, so this ferromagnet pumps some spin current into the normal metal, and the spin current spin is a form of angular momentum. This means that this ferromagnet will lose some angular momentum, and this this will in turn have a reciprocal effect. So it will show up as a torque into the magnetization dynamics and uh, well depending on the direction of the spin current it can it can show as an extra damping in the ferromagnet in the ferromagnet okay so and the title of the title of the talk included this term of spin battery effect and what do we need mean by this this is a 
concept again by this is by Pratas, and I, I'm not sure if Cherkovniak was actually also involved here. Probably he's one of the authors here also. And uh, so, so a charge battery, just to compare, is a, is a some source of charge. And, and because you cannot really generate charge, charge is conserved, you need two poles for charge battery. But spin battery can be a little different because, because spin is not conserved. We just saw that you can generate it by, by this, uh, by this uh, processing magnetization. Then you actually only need one, one pole for the spin battery. And, and because spin is not conserved, you also and you cannot you cannot store spin like you can store charge. You must you must generate it constantly if you want to have a constant source of spin. And this generation is done by by indeed having this this processing magnetization, which then pumps pumps spin into these normal metals. I just I just draw two normal metals here just to show that, just to kind of compare the normal regular battery where you would have a current flowing in from the other side and out from the other side. But here it's flowing out from both sides. Mm. And, and this is uh, this is spin battery in the case that this uh, normal metal has weak weak uh, spin relaxation so that this the spin accumulation here is not relaxed immediately but it uh, it will stay there and then you can you could use it to you can direct it to some other other element of your circuit then if you are interested in some spintronic application, then then you could plug this in there. Mm, okay, so there, but but there will be some different components in this spin accumulation. So it will tend to follow this uh, rotating magnetization somewhat. So there will be an AC component in this XY plane and then some DC component along the processing axis, which is said here. And indeed it is determined by some balance. Well, here's some, some calculation, what kind, of, what kind of effect you get, but this is the details are not important here. This has been also experimentally verified that you can do this. Okay, so so then then we go on to superconductivity. We want to consider how how does superconductivity modify this this effect and and uh, yes. So first first, what do we mean by superconductivity here? It's just a, just a regular BCS BS, BCS superconductivity with S wave S wave order parameter. So, so we have some pairing correlations there, and then 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 we have the order parameter, which is which is um, made possible by this lambda, which is the attractive electron phonon interaction inside the metal. Uh, this uh, relevant things here will be that this uh, superconductor has the has the energy gap of two delta or excitation gap of, of one delta. And then it has very nonlinear density of states. And uh, this, this uh, it, it also has a coherence length, which is, which is quite long compared, typically quite long compared to some, any atomic length scales in the system. Now, now then, then when we couple this uh, superconductor with the uh, ferromagnetic insulator, 
we can again consider this this kind of reflection at the boundary what is the effect from this and uh, now instead of single electrons we have cooper pairs here which are composed of downspin and upspin and when this uh, this uh, our s wave s wave uh, superconductor has these singlet Cooper pairs, which are superpositions like this. When they reflect from the boundary, this, this individual electrons gather a phase shift of uh, phi, phi half, which means that this first component gathers a phase shift of phi, and this second gathers a phase shift of minus phi. So again, we can decompose this, this uh, different components and now this in, instead of x and y we now have a singlet and triplet components <clears throat> so this uh, ferromagnetic insulator here genera generates transforms these singlet Cooper pairs into triplet Cooper pairs and this uh, amount depends on on the on this uh, phase how much phase is gathered inside in the in one reflection and uh, now now this uh, triplets mean that this the, the the presence of the triplets simply shows up at, in the density of states as this spin splitting at the fermi surface this density of states is, is split in the spin up and uh, spin down bands which have uh, they are separated by some ex exchange energy this is very similar to what happens if you put a if you have a thin film superconductor and then you put an in-plane magnetic field there that will also split the density of states Now this is this is just still a singlet superconductor in the sense that that the order parameter itself is is a singlet because you cannot cannot generate uh, this triplet this uh, triplet component here is has a well because of the fermionic antisymmetric is uh, antisymmetry this to total thing has to be odd in changing these electrons but but since this the, here is plus then, then then this means that this it has to be odd odd in frequency so then with the with just a static in interaction you cannot generate the dynamic order parameter which would be required so in that sense it's it's a regular superconductor uh, but but it indeed it has this spin splitting of two two h where h is the it's this uh, you can define it if if you parameterize this uh, phase shift by this uh, jsd which would be kind of an interaction strength at the interface then this H will be JSD divided by D, uh, where D is the thickness of the superconductor. The, this assumes that that we that, that the superconductor is uh, thinner than the coherence length, so that you can you can take this take this uh, triplet component to diffuse into the superconductor kind of uh, homogeneously. Now this. Uh, Spin splitting cannot be arbitrarily large. It's uh, if if it goes above this uh, delta over square root of two, then uh, then superconductivity becomes thermodynamically unstable and and vanishes. So this limits limits the kind of how large an exchange that you can have, but it's still. It's uh, still a large field because it can be 
and it, well depending on the superconductor it can be like a few few teslas uh, i mean if you if you would try to do the same splitting with an external magnetic field then you would need a few tesla magnet magnetic field strength but here you don't have any external field you just have the interaction with from the ferromagnetic insulator and this uh, density of states here in total it's symmetric but but it's if you just look at one spin around the fermi energy then it's very asymmetric which means that there are strong strong uh, thermospin and thermoelectric effects in this system and this has been well here's a review of this of this topic of this uh, spin split superconductor so there you can find many examples of of this uh, how how this can be used now spin pumping spin pumping into superconductors specifically so um, so indeed in in normal metal systems when you when you look at the spin pumping it, it typically typically increases the the damping of the of the magnet that is processing because in the, it was losing angular momentum and but but now in the if we just think if we take a superconductor and do kind of a zero order calculation then then this uh, this uh, superconductor has a gap so it is not possible to at low frequencies to pump pump quasi particles into the superconductor since there are no uh, states available there and this uh, this means that the spin susceptibility vanishes at low temperatures and and uh, then <clears throat> basically the superconductor does does nothing it, it just uh, becomes like a vacuum for the electrons it it is not it's not very exciting exciting thing in that case so so you can see if you if you if you have a normal if you look at the like damping of the magnet and and especially concentrate on the on the interface effect of course the magnet has other sources of damping but if you just consider this damping which is coming from the spin pumping then this will go down in temperature like this now if you if you do a little more involved calculation you can include a, like for a metallic ferromagnet say you can include a proximity effect so this metal will tend to tend to suppress the gap in the, in the superconductor but this will not this this will also result in a similar similar suppression of of this uh, spin pumping it's just uh, it just doesn't go to zero completely because there are some states still available where the where the delta is very small there has been some some experiments where where they actually observed an enhancement of this gilbert damping but i will not not go here to that that thing it's uh, it requires a different explanation and these are typically more complicated systems here we are just just talking about well, bilayers or perhaps trilayers where there's some some this is just some normal metal here so here here it is typically more more uh, complicated okay but but to so this was spin pumping but uh, spin pumping is kind of a this is that you assume that that the spin in the normal metal or superconductor is relaxed fast then this is typically the spin pumping regime but if you instead have a 
long spin relaxation times and you allow the spin to accumulate in the superconductor, then you are talking about the spin battery effect. And uh, to, to consider the spin battery effect, we need some tools. And these tools that we, that we have used are the, are, uh, are the non-equilibrium superconductor, quasi-classical non-equilibrium superconductivity toolbox, which includes this uh, like uh, at the dirty limit, we use this uh, Usadel equation to model, model the superconductor. And uh, okay, we can compare if we just, this is basically diffusion equation. If we were in the normal state, then the spin diffusion equation would be this simple. It just has three components for each individual spins, some diffusion constant and relaxation time. <clears throat> but now when we go to superconducting state, uh, we need a little more because because there the variables are actually these uh, propagators, Kelly's propagators, which are eight by eight matrices. They include the Keldis, Keldis components, which are kind of the spectral, spectral parts and then the distribution function. They encode those, those information there. And then each of these GR, GK and GA are are four by four matrices which have a number and uh, spin indices. So there's there's a lot, but but we can still understand this how how this works. I can recommend this review again. Um, <clears throat> so in this, uh, instead of having this kind of a simple diffusion equation just for spin. A superconductor actually actually couples. If we if we also have this exchange field, then the excitation spectrum in the superconductor looks like this, and they, it uh, couples these different non-equilibrium modes. So so we have a, like a heat mode coupled with the spin spin in the Z direction, which is now the direction of the exchange field. These are coupled, so you cannot consider them separately. If you, if you think of the spin accumulation, you have to have to think about the heat in some way. Other modes are also coupled. So, so well, this is natural that spin X and spin Y modes are coupled because, because the exchange field makes them precess. This also happens would happen in the normal state if there was an exchange field here. Mm, yeah. So now, now we actually get to this, this uh, our, our paper, the superconducting spin battery. <clears throat> and I guess I am not going to stay in my 30 minutes now because I've already almost spent that, but okay. This um, magnetic proximity effect couples spin and heat, and and we can write this like a, this is a, an ap approximate spin diffusion equation for this system. Then, so so you inject spin spin current and uh, some energy current from the ferromagnetic insulator. And this uh, spin current, uh, the, well, let's talk about energy current first. This energy will then relax to different different sources. So, so you can it can relax to lattice by electron phonon interaction, or then then for simplicity we also use this Dines parameter to model model the inelastic relaxation. So. This is just some some arbitrary source uh, or arbitrary sink of energy. Then, but then then the spin 
spin diffusion equation is more interesting because there you have this this fs is now basically the spin accumulation and uh, and then there's the spin relaxation this what would be what you have in the normal state but then you also have a coupling between a spin and energy so this energy gets converted to spin and this uh, kind of increases the spin accumulation in the system this can be understood from the from the uh, excitation spectrum so imagine we have a we have this spin split spectrum it's up up spin down spin and then we have occupied these states in in a fashion that this is purely energy accumulation so this these excitations total, total excitations here should be uh, spin neutral but now now this uh this uh, Upspin, there's this upspin uh, electrons tend to relax to these unoccupied states in the downspin band by by some spin scattering, spin orbit scattering. Christo, maybe may I just interrupt because uh, there is a, a point in the in the uh, part and West makes it point that the, the, the diagrams are not understandable. So maybe you explain actually what what are you plotting here. Ah, can you can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Yeah, I'm not saying that they're not understandable, but I'm saying that I don't understand them at the moment, right? Okay, okay. But but my question would be that if you have on the right a relaxed state with spin accumulation, you I think you have two branches, right? Yes. And they are if if I look at the uh, at the non-magnetic material, right, and I look to, uh, draw the dispersions of the spin up and the spin down, yeah. Then yes. and I look at equilibrium. Then I get the situation which is on the right, yeah. Yes, yes. But I would not call that a spin accumulation. I would call it it's a state with a with a finite magnetization, but it's not a non-equilibrium yes. spin accumulation. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's not the, it's not uh, necessarily an equilibrium state, so that this this distribution would be determined by by a thermal distribution but but okay. yes i think I, I think I, sh I should let you proceed and then try and i'll try to understand it again because this this i all i, all, I have well, difficulties in understanding these these diagrams uh, for uh, for already for 59 yeah. years of my life so maybe maybe <laughs> let, let's proceed then yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that yeah this is of course a matter of definitions but here we define this energy mode and well this F energy accumulation like this that it involves no spin and this uh spin accumulation is then that we calculate the total spin of the excitations and and see what it is and and for these quantities we could of course def define them differently they get get different kind of uh diffusion equation for these quantities we get this kind of a diffusion equation and about the but this uh spin accumulation or magnetization which we get in the end can be then from from this these equations can be solved to be like this so so this is the normal what, what we would again have in the normal state this is the contribution there but then then we get an extra con, uh, contribution from the from this energy mode coupling and this depends on the energy relaxation how how strong it is Now this was just like uh, this previous page was kind of a sketch what happens in the system, but but then we actually calculated this this with this uh, full Husserl form formulation, expanded the Husserl equation, uh, different harmonics of Husserl equation, the second order perturbation theory, and uh, determined the spin accumulation. Within this, within this perturbation, second order perturbation, and uh, this is this is what we find is that yes, here's a frequency and a temperature. You can you can see that there's a kind of a 
um, the superconducting gap shows up here here in this as as this form because you need two delta excitations at low temperatures to generate anything. But here you have a, like a if you if you look at the normal state spin accumulation, it's all gray here because it's all near zero. So if I remember correctly, it's this is normalized so that that this normal state value is is of the order of one. And then then this means that this uh, superconducting spin accumulation is then uh, like a two orders of magnitude larger. There are some features here though. So like this one, two, and three denote different processes which generate this spin accumulation. So this uh, one is the is uh, like a, this first process lifts from the occupied downband to the unoccupied uh, occupied up band to unoccupied down and this this spin and this uh, this is suppressed for frequencies smaller than the gap because it has to be has to uh, the frequency has to be large enough but then then the uh, also the yes okay so then and then the second process is is kind of this which uh, requires a finite temperature so that this this uh, there's some finite occupation of this downband here and then this pre-existing quasi particle is then then lifted to the upper spin band and this generates this peak here there's also a third process which depends on taking an electron uh, taking a spin from here to here and then uh, then it requires some finite relaxation, spin relaxation to, to generate spin here. And this creates a little smaller, smaller peak here. And this, this we can see that this also, well, I didn't show it here, but it correlates with this energy accumulation in the system. So it supports our our this uh, spin this diffusion equation and now to measure actually this this spin accumulation we propose a setup like this that we have this uh, superconductor ferromagnet that insulate the bilayer and then uh, then put a ferromagnetic metal with a tunnel coupling to the superconductor which measures now now this uh, well Yes, so, so th then, then this spin accumulation in the superconductor generates a voltage in the ferromagnetic metal. And in this non-local setup, the superconductor here doesn't have any spin accumulation. Normal metal gets no voltage. So this, there, there you can then see this, this non-local voltage. And, and here's the signal. It is very similar to this spin accumulation. So it measures the same thing. Now, this this was kind of the fmr driven setup, but we could also instead of driving the ferromagnetic insulator with a with a coherent drive, we can also use some like a spin hole effect to heat this heat this magnon system in this insulator and. Uh, and this will also generate the spin current by spin Seebeck effect. And we can we have calculated this in the same way as as this coherent coherent thing. You can you need to replace some things, but the spin current is basically given by this. So so that there's there's the spin susceptibility of the superconductor and then the magnet propagator. And this de determines the pumped spin current. This generates then then a then a voltage that is that is uh, proportional to this uh, 
temperature difference between these two systems. And uh, yes, so so this this depends the Seebeck of coefficient. It depends on whether the uh, whether this ferromagnetic insulator generates. Uh, it, it depends on the alignment of the spin accumulation the superconductor, whether it's uh, anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic. So this is why we have this uh, blue and red curves here. These are for different orientation, different signs of the interaction at the interface. But uh, nevertheless, we get some large spin shape coefficient. Uh, this, these are here for different materials, we chose the parameters so that I think this solid line is for... Sorry, it's not spin Zabiak, it's usual Zabiak. Ah, okay, okay, yes, thanks. Thanks, Mihail. So, okay, those, these solid lines are perhaps for niobium and uh, what is it, YIG system, and these uh, gas lines are for aluminum and aerobium sulfide, perhaps. I don't remember exactly, but okay. This this calculation here depended on this uh, phenomenological gamma relaxation. So not everybody believes in Dine's parameter. So we decided to do also a different different calculation, which would involve which, in which we use uh, the, uh, more realistic energy relaxation. So so we put uh, electron phonon coupling. And uh, to simplify things, we write this uh, quasi-equilibrium model so that these different subsystems have different, we assume that they are thermalized at, at their own temperatures. So this superconducting electrons have, have temperature T, Ts and then the phonons have T, some other temperature, the magnons, in the ferromagnetic insulator have again some temperature and then these this, uh, conductances here are calculated calculated from the Usadel theory with electron phonon coupling. So okay so it's a fairly complicated system but but of course it's a linear system so it can be solved and there's uh, it gives a similar similar kind of uh, Sebeck coefficient as with as the previous calculation so it supports supports this calculation it's uh, some features are different at low temperatures this electron phonon relaxation gives a larger Sebeck coefficient because it it vanishes vanishes faster than this uh, Dines parameter this is now this is a very large Sebeck coefficient. So perhaps this system could be used as a magnon, magnon detector. Okay, and here, here are my conclusions. So we have co considered the spin battery effect in the ferromagnetic insulated superconductor bilayer and that find this giant enhancement of the spin battery effect. And also, uh, on this Sebeck uh, large large Sebeck effect, and this uh, actually I give my motivation for our, our motivation for this for this project <laughs> in the end. So so this was this was inspired by this uh, large enhancement in the inverse pinhole effect in this this paper, in which involved like involved superconductor superconducting elements and so there was some very large spin hole effect and we we think that this is connected with our our large spin accumulation here but our theory did not include any spin orbit interaction spin hole angle so this would be need to be added added for, to actually describe this but this this is later work. Okay, thank you for for your attention.
Thank you, Ristand. Uh, thanks. Uh, now it's time for questions. So I guess for Bart, this is also a suggestion of measurement. So yes, now now it's uh, time. You just can un unmute and. Yeah, it's a suggestion of measurements, and I really would like to measure to measure this. But I first like to understand it. I think normally you could say you have the different sequences. You do a me you measure it and then you try to understand it, or you try to understand it first and then you, you do do a measurement. And I have, I I I want always want to do two two of them. So could you please go back to these diagrams because I really would like to understand them. Okay, so uh, I th so so what am I actually seeing the here? Right? So so you could say I am seeing the. Uh, the dispersion of of you of the quasi particle states that correct yeah the and, yes yes and they are now spin split so apparently i can label the blue one as spin up and the red one as spin down yes yeah? if you okay. add a add an exudation on the up spin band then then it will increase the spin of the system yeah no, no no i would first like to understand it so so that means that, for instance, I mean, but I come back to this in the second part of my question. So we are assuming uh, that 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 spins are a good quantum number. So at the moment we are assuming that there is no spin-orbit interaction, right? Yes. Okay. And then I would say, so this the situation which you now draw, uh, meaning that the there is that this would imply there is some thermal distribution of the uh, or for thermal oct occupation of these quasi-particle states, right? You mean in the in the left? In the left, left and also in the right. Well, it's not. The, the, the left is not a thermal one, right? It's not a thermal one, yes. The, but the right is a thermal one. It's, yes. It's also non-thermal, so it's. Uh, well, no, it's a uh, thermal one because you 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 occupy all the states up to the same all states at the same energy up to the same up to the same value, so it's a thermal one. Okay, you could uh, say okay. You could. You, it does not have to be a thermal one, but there is no an equilibrium between the blue one and the and the red one. Uh, exactly, but 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 uh, the the uh, the quantity of this uh, <coughs> so the occupation number sh should not be a thermal one, or if it is thermal one, the temperature can be different from the detector. From the from the the temperature of electrons in the detecting electrode. Yes, of course, but I mean, but but I would have the tendency if I see a diagram, right? I try to compare it with uh, how it would look like if I have a, a normal a metal in the normal state with a with a magnetic field on. Then I would say on the right, right, I have an occupation of the state which is given like that. So for sure there is a magnetization, but this is an equilibrium property. There is no spin accumulation because if I connect the one on the right to uh, to anything else, there is not going to be a spin current by definition, not because the spin up and the spin down are occupied up to the same Fermi energy. Yes, but the, if they are occupied to the energy which is different from the detector electrode. No, 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 no. I, again, the basic rule is that I can only get transport uh, of whatever uh, whatever electronic or spintronic quantities, if there is a difference in Fermi energies, or, uh, or temperatures, or temperatures, or temperatures. this is, this, or, or this is a therm thermodynamic effect. So Sorry? if you have a T one, so so you are right that this is kind of an internal equilibrium in within the. Uh, yes, you could say it's an internal equilibrium, assuming that the electrons are at a certain or or a quasi at a certain temperature. Yeah. Yeah. The temperature, of course, can be different from somewhere else. Yeah. Yes. So that is so. So, but then I would not call the state on the right a spin accumulation because I think that term is used for a non-equilibrium state. So. Yeah, yeah. but you can you can have the spin accumulation also by driving. So let's say that you have a local heating of your of your system. So you cannot actually. Uh, there is no strict definition in this sense. Yeah, yes, I think there is because 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 the difference between a spin accumulation and and a magnetization is okay. The mag so if I have a 
uh, a system like this, and this would be a normal state system. I apply a big field, right? What am I going to do? I am going to shift the spin up and the spin down bands. So in equilibrium, the Fermi energies have to be the same, which means that I will have a magnetization, correct? It's, yeah, it's, uh, correct. Magnetization. Yes. But it's magnetic. not going to give you a spin accumulation because there is no driving force for a spin current to another system. Yeah? True. In the left one, there is, right? Because I have occupied the blue spin states up to a higher energy than the red one. Right? So I would say that the red one, at certainly for, 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 from the spin point of view, is that the left one corresponds to a situation where there is a spin accumulation, a driving force for the spin current, but the right one, there is no driving force for the spin current. Yeah? That, that depends uh, 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 how... <clears throat> so to measure the spin current, you need to to bring this system in contact with, with the, some other electrons. Yeah, so if you put the right system, if you if, let's say if you take... that's. Uh, uh, if, if you compare it with a normal system with a spin splitting, right? Yes. And if you would connect it to a, let's say you would locally apply an exchange field or locally apply a, uh, have you noticed? Oh, mag I okay, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, that's fine. So, so locally you, you apply an exchange field or a, or a magnetic field and, and, and uh, next to it, there is the same system, metal system, which has no exchange field. Right? There would be no current, no spin if current, they, no charge current. Exactly. But but this this uh, this system on the right is uh, non is in the non-equilibrium state as compared to the uh, to to some electrodes which are not driven by the no, this is where we disagree, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean if you have a different temperature. It has a different it effectively if you it have has a, a different, different temperature, temperature, obviously, yes. Yeah, then, then, and, then the, and a different and temperature can indeed, in this situation, also drive a spin current. That is and correct. This temperature, yeah. So our claim is that this temperature is generated by, by this uh, spin precession. Okay, then I have another question, and that is the following. So if I would do the same experiment with a normal metal, and I would put my Fermi energy between the uh, b below the, the bottom of the, of the spinner band and above the bottom of the spin down band, right? So I had the Fermi energy and I assume that the temperature is low enough. What can I then say about uh, the, uh, the spin relaxation? And my, I would say the following, if we have a small spin orbit interaction, which is generating the spin relaxation, and there is no exchange field or no magnetic field, then we have a certain value for the spin orbit relaxation time. But if we are then going to create that situation where the Fermi energy is in between uh, the blue and the, and the red band, so there are only red electrons at the Fermi energy, I would say that the spin relaxation would be suppressed. But there is no, in the normal state, there is no... That is in the normal state. So, uh, but my question is, is there, is that basically the same reason why the spin relaxation is suppressed in the superconducting state? Or is, there, think... is there another microscopic, uh, microscopic reason, right? Because if you have to go, yeah, that, that is, a, that is what, what keeps on puzzling me. Uh, actually, you need the, the symmetry in the density of states. Uh, and okay. essentially, the, the same condition as for the thermoelectric effects. Yeah. So if you well, put the Fermi energy between these levels, I think more or less the same physics will. You're the same physics, right? Okay, so I think that is also what I would think. Uh, but I mean, I've, 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 okay, let's let's keep it like this because I have many more questions. But uh, maybe we should discuss about that in a little bit more detail some other time. But I really try to understand this, and 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 I'm making some slow progress. But well, I have to think a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Bart, for, for the questions. I think Max has had a uh, hand raised, and then uh, there is Eric who asked the question in the chat. So let's start with Max. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm <laughs> more or less asking the same what Bart uh, was asking. Uh, so if we compare these two diagrams with um, density of states, 
don't you think that the diagram on the left uh, represent, is represented by two split uh, peaks of the same height? Meanwhile, the diagram on, on the right should be represented by two split peaks of different heights. So you have like different population of these two states. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, good. This is exactly the point that if you have a, this nonlinear density of states, then, then you will. So then why system does not rel relax to the state when all of these spins are of the same? <laughs> Because, 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 yeah, because exactly because this uh, spin down band has has larger density of states, so so the spin spin tends tends to relax. It's, it's oh, spin, spin relax to the uh, spin relax uh, to the state when the spin is the same or in all uh, energy level. Uh, but you see on the on the red band. On the right, there are just more, more, more states available on the bottom. For the so so the comparison will be the same. So but, it's not a but relaxation it, process, it's just a density of states question. So if, if you have no relaxation from one state to another state, the system still will have both directions. If you have no relaxation, well, well, if you, you so here there. we show this, this. So here we show the process when we we assume that we we just initially just inject the energy into the superconductor, uh, and that this it is shown on the on the left. So we have just purely energy imbalance, uh, which means that the the number of spins are the the same on the spin up and spin down branches. Uh, but uh, this system is. Uh, like un unstable uh, uh, towards the, the fast spin relaxation because there are, uh, as you can see, the, the, there are different number of spin at the same uh, spin uh, occupation at Are the same mean? energy level. Yeah, and it's shown by this uh, blue arrows, blue horizontal arrows, uh, spin can relax in mm -hmm. this available states to, to the available states. Okay. And this creates uh, the the spin imbalance from energy imbalance, actually. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Maybe that's I that's have to take into account question. that now we have here kind of both spin and then the electron hole a degree of freedom, which need to be balanced. Uh, okay, but let's go to this question that Eric is asking about the uh, uh, omega dependence. Uh, so it's on slide 14. Do you want to say it aloud or shall I read it? Uh, slide okay. 14. I actually didn't read it yet. So, so Eric, do you want to say it aloud? Your question? Okay, so I will read it. So, uh, yeah, so there is uh, um, about it's a question of regarding the plot of spin enhancement as a function of omega and temperature. Uh, why is the plot not symmetric in omega? That is what differentiates clockwise and anticlockwise rotation of the magnetization. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, it, so it's uh, so so different signs of omega are actually different polarizations of the of no different different precession directions of this magnetization. So so in in one direction you can have like a Resonance, but if you if you rotate to different direction, then then you won't have a resonance. So, because because basically this this precession here has a has a natural direction, so it's not it's not symmetric in that sense. So it's this. Uh, I think this. Well, I cannot precession. add. So, like for example, left hand precession can excite just from the spin down to the spin up. Yes, yes. So you can also see it from this diagram that that uh, that if you if your frequency is positive, then then it will always raise these electrons here. But if it's negative, then it would it would correspond to this kind of absorption uh, emission. 
emission. And so, okay, negative, negative frequency means that we have right hand precession in the counterclockwise. Yeah. And it can uh, just excite them from spin down to spin up. And if positive frequency, it's vice versa. And in practice, you would uh, sort of uh, see this change by, by uh, sort of, I mean, there, there's a parameter that is basically the sign of the, of, of the J, this, this coupling constant that determines which, which branch should, you should be looking at. So, but, right. but this, this uh, asymmetry is already present in the magnetization dynamics of this, of this ferromagnet by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope it was clarified. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I don't see at the moment any other questions. And now Krista's timeline has been exactly doubled compared to half an hour, <laughs> but that was to be expected. So uh, thank you all for attending and thanks for the nice discussion. Thank you, Risto. Thank you.